All right. So to start talking about electromagnetic waves, we're going to start talking about Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. So we've seen in the past that, you know, we have electricity, we have magnetism, and now we obviously know of electromagnetism and electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation, and we tie the two together. Back in the day, it wasn't well understood so that they were one and the same, a part of some larger synthesis. So Maxwell kind of put this together. So if you recall, if I have uh, moving charges in a magnetic field, they'll feel a force due to that magnetic field. And so we know that at least there's some relationship going on there between things that are charged, which can cause electric fields, so as well as them being able to feel magnetic fields. So it turns out Maxwell looked at this, and then he also looked at the fact that moving charges can cause a magnetic field. So, and he started trying to put this all together, and he kind of had this belief that nature is symmetrical. And so, you know, and he started looking for some missing pieces. So we talk about Maxwell's equations and we call them Maxwell equations, but we don't actually give you his equations. So because his equations are written in math and most of us don't understand the language of math. Uh, and so instead of looking at Maxwell's equations, we actually interpret what they mean. So but Maxwell went and, you know, took and synthesized all the things that we'd learned in the areas of electricity and magnetism from people like Coulomb and Faraday, people like this, and put it all together. And so Maxwell's first equation can be kind of summarized in saying that electric field lines originate on positive charges and terminate on negative charges. That's ultimately what his first equation meant. Maxwell's second equation showed that whereas in charges you can have individual either positive or negative charges, you can't have an individual north or south pole with a magnet. So magnetic fields, instead of originating anywhere, actually run in loops like this, and you don't have what we call monopoles, just a north or just a south, whereas in electricity we can totally have electric monopoles, just a positive or just a negative. So cut this magnet in half, you end up with two magnets that still have a magnetic dipole. So Maxwell's third equation dealt with Faraday's and Lenz's law, and it just says that if you have a changing magnetic flux, so you can induce an EMF, right? So and technically he didn't look at it as magnetic flux, it wasn't quite around, but he looked at a varying magnetic field, which is a way to get a changing magnetic flux is doing that. So that's kind of summarized in Faraday's and Lenz's laws. So, and then finally, he looked at moving charges being able to cause a magnetic field. And we saw this with like a current. So a current is moving charges. So, and if we look at the right hand rule, we could say that moving your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers wrap around in the direction of the magnetic field caused by that current. So, and we had an equation, you know, B equals mu naught I over two pi R. So, and that's ultimately what Maxwell's fourth equation summarized there in this case, and that's actually a, a relation to Ampere's law. These first two were relations to Gauss's law for both electricity and magnetism. And so ultimately, that's what Maxwell's equations ultimately said. So, and Maxwell took some things that he, he actually took it a step further. There were some things he couldn't prove, um, but he predicted the presence of waves. And these waves would have an electric field and a magnetic field. He even predicted that they would travel at the speed of around 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So, but he had no evidence for this and stuff like that. And he died before he could ever figure out some, some evidence for this. So, but a guy named Hertz came along and Hertz actually provided for that evidence. So we're going to take a look at Hertz's experiment here just a little bit. So if you look at Hertz's experiment, he had an LC circuit, L for inductor, C for capacitor. So, and he envisioned, so he, I say he envisioned, he actually did this. He charged up a capacitor. So, and then he closed the switch. And so at time zero, the capacitor was at maximum charge. So, and had a potential energy equal to this here. This is, you know, this is one form we saw earlier. This is another form of the same thing if we substitute in what delta V is in terms of C equaling uh, Q over delta V. And in this case, at a time zero, all the potential energy in this circuit is stored in the capacitor, but as it discharges when we close the switch, you'll start to have more and more current flowing through this inductor. And if you get more and more current flowing through that inductor, you'll start getting a magnetic field being generated. So, and as that magnetic field generated, you start storing uh, potential energy in the inductor in this form. And so once this thing completely discharges, all of a sudden all that potential energy that initially was in the capacitor ends up being in the inductor. So, but then with no continue, you know, no push of current from the capacitor anymore, then the inductor reverses the direction and recharges up the capacitor and they just keep going back and forth, trading off potential energy. And so it just oscillates back and forth like this. 
So this is kind of the basis for what Hertz did. So Hertz took just such an LC circuit and he started pulsing it with potential differences. So, and when he pulsed it with a potential difference, so he had another identical LC circuit located a few meters away, so it wasn't exactly close. So, and what he found out is if he matched up the capacitance and inductance here of these guys, and if you do that, you end up getting what's called the resonant frequency. And if these guys were the same resonant frequency, so what he found out is that the energy, so that he was dissipating in this with these voltage pulses, ended up being transmitted over here. So, and he could tell because he could see the capacitor actually would start to spark. So, and even though they're separated by several meters, so, you know, they'd studied magnetic fields before. I knew that, you know, magnetic field, they didn't actually have to be in contact, but they had to be somewhat close. So this wasn't quite that. So, but he actually verified Maxwell's prediction. So, and it turns out Maxwell predicted that when you have accelerating charges, there should be these electromagnetic waves that are part electric field, part magnetic field. So, and in this case, it had traveled several meters over to this lovely guy. He took it a step further. He took this electromagnetic waves. He looked and studied interference patterns with them, the ability to be polarized, things of a sort, everything we now know to tr be true about light and stuff and their wave-like properties. So, and he went and he ran an interference pattern and by measuring the difference between fringes, he actually calculated out a wavelength for the light and then used that in the frequency to actually calculate out the speed of light. Guess what he got for the speed of light? about 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, totally giving Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism huge credence. So it also led to the conclusion that light, which travels at 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, was a form of electromagnetic radiation, just a small sliver of that spectrum.